Hello, we're at the Skull World Forum in Oxford in the UK and with me is Abbas Mpindi, CEO of the Media Challenge Initiative, a Uganda-based organisation supporting the next generation of journalists in Africa. Abbas, hi, welcome, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you at Skull World Forum, but as well as, you know, the side of family that I love so much. Thank you. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about what the initiative does and um, what motivated you to start it in the first place? Um, thank you very much. MCI, or Media Challenge Initiative, is a youth-driven, not-for-profit supporting and building the next generation of journalists. It started from a personal experience of failing to enter into the job market because of you know, an experience of being asked if you know anyone uh, in the uh, TV station. And walking back, I was asking myself how many other young people go through the same. And for me, it felt preventable. So I started by bringing the industry together to see young journalists compete so that they can be seen uh, based on the skill and based on the character and what they can provide to the media houses. So in terms of let people have access to jobs and internship based on technical know-how rather than technical know-how, which is really highly common in some industries like the media. Mm. Yeah. And your mantra as an organization is that journalism can make the world a better yes, place. Yes, yes. Um, how are you <laughs> equipping journalists to, to do that? So, you know, Ruth, at the beginning, we thought it would be, you know, just a skilling program, access to a computer, to a software, to a camera, and then you can edit and produce uh, content. But then experience have shown that it's more than just a skilling program. You need to look at the whole individual. They are emotional, they are spiritual, sort of like mental well-being. And the fact that for us to be able to invest in that, we had to look at the, the vision of that individual and where they're coming from. So we inculcate from the beginning, uh, visioning and missioning of this young journalist to understand that the next 10 years or 30 years or 50 years from now, their work is going to be history. And so the stories they tell uh, will create a better world for now, for the next generation. So I personally believe that because I've seen it, um, you know, work. I've seen journalism change the world, whether it's an investigation or an entertainment story or an information explainer story. All these pieces, when done really, really well, they, you know, set their agenda, they inform, they educate, they entertain. And unfortunately, that's one of the things we're losing right now, considering, you know, all the misinformation that is uh, spreading on social media and, and definitely finding way in normal conversations on a daily. Mm. And um, solutions journalism, um, yeah. you're a big advocate of, of that. What do you, what's meant by that and, and why do you support that approach? Um, I love solutions journalism to the heart because I think, especially coming from Africa and Uganda in particular, is that for a very long time we have been seen and and produced and portrayed in a in a way that shows Africa is a dark continent in quotes, and that it's uh, all you see, all you ever see, are stories of diseases and poverty. I don't have to repeat that. But the whole thing is, is more than that, than just that. So we say, um, we want the whole story. I'm not asking you to positive news me. I'm asking you to do the whole story. And that whole story means you're covering the challenge, but also there are people who are working every day to fix those issues. Can we also get to hear those stories without saying it's public relations? So I believe that solutions journalism can help to change narratives of communities. They think what's really critical right now is people have shown that they are really getting tired of news that is negative and that is because these problems already exist and they know about these problems. And the, the, the best we could try and do as a journalism industry is to show that we are also a source of hope and a source of inspiration 
and the source of critical response is that um, there's, you know, other people are implementing and need to be seen by the world to be replicated. So for me, it's really important, especially from our part of the world, to show the urgency each and every effort that is invested by young people in our communities. That's all super positive. And you come to somewhere like Skoll and it, there's, you know, it's full of this inspiration, yes. these stories of hope, <laughs> this um, solutions. Of but yeah. how as journalists, um, you know, how do you prevent journalists from just becoming um, PR mouthpieces for these solution proponents, that, some of which, you know, may be flawed? Mm -hmm. I, I say, of course, they are the, the principal pillars that you need to follow as a journalist uh, to be able to document a very good solutions journalism story. But I also think that, you know, it's, it's still solutions journalism also still follows the ethical principles of storytelling as a journalist. So you know when this story is just a path you know, peer, uh, you know, so it should be, so the judgment is very critical for every journalist to know, like, why am I this, telling this story? Why is it, why is this story important to the community if, if I tell this story? And is it, uh, yeah, you know, let me help a friend to kind of story, or is it actually a critical response to a social problem that's um, affecting a community? Mm -hmm. um, so that for me is a good background. And then investigate further uh, by talking to people who are watching, observing, or being, you know, beneficial to that project to give you critical feedback around does it really work? Is there evidence of impact? Uh, or are we... So people will be able to tell you. And for me, it's really important that because we fall into the trap of of um, think oh it's gonna be a public relations story. I think every story has a public relations uh, piece to it, and that can be debated. By <laughs> I think it could be bad public relations. I think it could be good. So, so in essence, it's it's. Um, The, the, the ability to be able to even show the limitation of that solution to the world so that whoever wants to replicate it uh, can, can objectively see that you are able to provide those facts, that they don't blindly just you know, try and take this in their community and it doesn't work. So being able to show where it has worked and where it didn't work and, and some of those gaps is really important, which you can't do if you are a public relations profession. A big focus of the Media Challenge Initiative is on innovation and um, that's something that, uh, that we also share at SciDev. Um, our focus is on science and innovation. Um, why, why is that important to you and what excites you in, in in terms of um, innovation within the media landscape at the moment? So when we started, we were thinking about uh, skilling and employment of young journalists. Um, the work now has advanced into innovations and our innovations focusing on uh, this idea of media viability. And uh, a lot of people think about it in terms of money. We also say, uh, there are other components that you must think about. So journalism education, for example, a hundred percent or even more contributes to the quality of journalism that you have. And that quality of journalism that you actually have contributes to how people consume and pay, right? Um, so if you have bad journalists or unqualified journalists, well, your content is not going to compete on the market, and yet the market is never going to see you as a, a custodian of factual information, right? And so if you think about um, news places that are considered now, or communities or niches that are considered news deserts where you don't have information, um, 
for for young people to invest in more factual reporting on climate change. So if they start young, give them five years, they'll become experts on reporting about climate change issues. And that's what you want, right? Um, if you talk about misinformation, this getting them young to innovate about, you know, different ideas, fact-checking, um, to then, so that by the time they have grown, they know that, you know, they are full innovation. So right now we start when they're young. It's risky now. They can take risks uh, so that they're able to innovate around different niches of journalism, um, from fact-checking, reporting about migration, minority groups, to climate change. And for us, um, as, a, as a media development organization, we're also thinking about how that correlates with the supply of news to as many, to reach as many people as we can. So one of the new innovations we have is the MCI SDG Media Van, which is a bold statement for us to take journalism to communities that you rarely reach, you know. So we drive this mini bus with a studio inside and we go to a community. We partner with a reporter in there or an organization and we document a solution. When we are done with that, we then screen the story with the community, they get to experience, they get to see themselves in the story, and then we have a constructive conversation. Um, so so as you know, consumption of media is also changing, you want to innovate around how do we consume media now directly with the people, uh, as if they were having like a dinner of a sort. Mm. Yeah. And we can't talk about journalism at the moment really without talking about AI um, yeah. and you touched upon misinformation and disinformation, um, which has obviously been exacerbated by AI. Um, what do you see it as a risk or an, an opportunity, uh, AI in Africa um, for journalists right now? Um. It's, I mean, I think I would say a bigger part of me thinks there's a, a risk, but I also think there's an opportunity there. Um, and not to just sound academic, but I, also, mm -hmm. I think that because I say bigger much of a risk because most of our communities are still um, media illiterate and digital illiterate. And so the power that, you know, artificial intelligence has if it's put in the wrong hands, is now getting more sophisticated that people who are digitally illiterate would never tell the difference. If it's a deep fake or they'll never, like, who would help, right? Mm -hmm. And so with that kind of, um, if we are, and so you have communities that are still almost thinking and operating in sort of like an agricultural rev revolution way back, right? And then you have communities that are, have advanced into artificial intelligence, fourth revolution. Um, and when you think about that difference, then it becomes really scary to imagine the people who are still on the other end of the spectrum and how they will be able to... Um, and mind you, you also need to understand that in some of the countries like Uganda, they are still the people who are already advanced and the people who are deploying these tools to you know, spread misinformation. And then there are global players who are also sending misinformation across Africa. And so you have a public that's highly illiterate on all those levels, just consuming whatever comes. And so that's why it becomes very critical now to say, you know, we need to have a discussion on artificial intelligence for good and how do we deploy it through journalists and through other players to make it you know user usable to solve these challenges and I think um, I say you know issues of, of, of misinformation and disinformation I think are very social 
problems because you you don't like an AI tool would not just create. There has to be an individual who has an intention to blackmail, to you know, malice another individual. Right? So or just other interests altogether. But there is an interest. There's somebody with an intention to hurt or to harm someone else, which is just entertain. Um and so that that for me has nothing to do with you know all these tools. It's the, it's us human beings that we need to be able to first um, deal with, I guess, <laughs> if that would be. So I I I think I say it starts. I say misinformation starts with you know love. The more we we love each other, the more it's hard for you to just spread a rumor or misinformation. It's very you know it's very written historically. You know, gossiping in most of these communities was always um, a an abomination. Lying is an abomination. Now we are seeing, you know, it's popular to actually lie. <laughs> uh, like you become famous for lying, and people be like, you have a group of people who actually believe and advance and continue to spread that. So, and then, so that's what makes it complicated because at the end of the day, you're dealing with individuals who have intentions to hurt. And so there has to be more than just multidisciplinary approaches to fighting that. Yeah. Abbas, it's been great talking to you. Thank you so much um, Thank for your you. time today.